plates. So here we are, webinar for today, e-learning, where do serious games make the most sense? Is our topic for today. So again, we have a lot of exciting things planned. Uh, some polls, some interactions, so we are, are really looking forward to our topic and everyone's participation. Now today we're going to have um, a little bit of a two-part webinar. We're going to introduce a software that can help you create some of these serious games, but then the bulk of the session will be us hearing from our guest speaker, and he'll be uh, sharing his insights and experiences with us about serious games. So we'll be showing you a tool to help build serious games and also hearing from um, an expert in the field on how this implementation can happen. So before we get underway, just a couple of, well, I guess we should introduce who's speaking, shouldn't we? I apologize. So with us, we have Ross Smith. He's going to be our speaker. And he has been in this gaming industry for more than 25 years. The last 20 have been spent at Microsoft. And he is the director of test in the Skype division. And he has a vast experience. He's um, authored things. He holds patents. He's been invited to the White House for various discussions, um, a frequent blogger. Uh, his team has used games to raise funds for disaster relief and have won awards for their gaming innovation. So really, he's coming to us with a huge background, a wealth of knowledge. So. We're really excited uh, to have Ross join us, and he'll be speaking in just a few minutes and, and giving us some ideas, sharing his experiences, so it's going to be jam-packed with, with information. And my name is Jamaica, and I'm in business development at Harbinger Knowledge Products. So that's who you'll be hearing from today, and hopefully everyone is, is with us uh, hearing and seeing. If not, we'll give you just a minute to, to get this set up and also take the opportunity to let you know that we have a large turnout today, so everyone uh, should be on mute. So if you want to talk with us through the question box, in GoToWebinar is the way to do that. So share your feedback, questions, comments, poll participation, uh, lots of ways to interact with us, but that's going to be the best. The session is being recorded, so you can view it later on for your reference, share it with some colleagues that weren't able to make it. And we will have a question and answer session at the conclusion of the webinar but we will do our best to address your questions as we go. So feel free to, to fill up that question box. We're <coughs> excited to hear from you. So as I mentioned, we're going to share briefly a tool with you that can help you build some of these serious games. I mean, hopefully if you had a chance to play some games while you were waiting for our session to start, you've already seen Raptivity, uh, some of the games in action. But just briefly, what Raptivity is, it's a software that is a template library that helps you build serious games, games um, without any programming knowledge. So it's a template-based library, so you choose the game that has the functionality you're looking for, then you get to customize it with all of your content. So your video, your audio, your background, your questions, your responses, uh, your feedback for your audience. So you get to completely customize it, give it your own flavor, and then once you've done that, you can incorporate that game into various platforms. You can put it in an e-learning course you already have built. You could put them on a website, on a web page, internally on an uh, intranet for your employees to use. You could just um, post it wherever your, your end users can access it. And again, it's very customizable. We have hundreds of people online today and we could ask each and every one of you to work with one of these templates and all of you without having any, um, or if you don't have flash programming, everyone could customize it and everyone's would look different. So it's a very flexible, powerful tool that can help you build out some of these games that we're going to be talking about. Now here's a, a quote you may have heard and the more I think about it, the more I I really think it's true. You can learn more about a man in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. So just really showing that, that playing and game playing coming together, 
um, you really do learn a lot, and it's really great for, for team building as well. And just a little more on the Raptivity side of uh, the gaming. There's 40 different, or over 40 different templates that will help you build out serious games. And they are based in different categories from letter games, popular television games, strategy games. There's a lot of different categories, a lot of different functionality. Um, so it's really going to help you enhance your current e-learning courses. And it will allow you to have this element of serious gaming. And again, because you don't have to have the, the customization, excuse me, the programming background to customize, it's a really great starting off point if you are looking to incorporate these serious games in your organization, but maybe you're not sure where to start. This can be a great jumping off platform. So what we want to do is we want to hear from all of you. We're going to launch a few polls here so, and find out where, where you're at maybe personally or in your organization here. So the first poll should be coming up here on your screen. And it's just pretty straightforward. Have you played any games in the last week? And we'll get that poll launched here. All right, so I see there's lots of quick participation. And we'll share the results here. Let's give it just another maybe five seconds. All right, any last minute votes? All right, let's go ahead and close this poll and share the results here. All right, so here you can see the results the majority of people have. So we have almost 70% yes. So let's go ahead here and launch our next poll. Have you played any games in an educational setting? All right, and we're getting the results flying in on this one. Lots of you are voting quickly. Thank you. All right, the majority of people have voted. Let's go ahead and close this poll and share the results. And again, the majority have played a game in an educational setting. So now let's go ahead and compare that with the last question here. Have you played games at work? Maybe compare that to um, the answer that we had at the educational setting. So let's go ahead and launch that last poll there. All right, there we go. And again, we're seeing... All right, and this answer is a little more split down the middle here. The first two were about a 70% yes to 30% no. And this one is just about dead even here. I'll give you five more seconds to give your response. All right, let's go ahead and close this poll and share the response. And look at this. We are dead split here down the middle, 50-50. <laughs> so different... Uh, response there from the other two. So interesting. So people are playing games in an educational setting, but not at work so much. So that might be interesting for Ross to note also as he's going forward. Okay, so the next question that we have, we actually... Let me go back here to sharing my screen. So our next question... is, let's give it a second here to come up on your screen, and this one we don't actually have a poll, but if you could chat to us in the question box there, um, talking about serious games, how, maybe how many serious games have you played? Maybe at work, maybe in education um, environment, but what's been your experience with 
serious games. Let's see. Okay, we're getting a variety of answers, and I would say the let's see. There's quite a few coming in here, so unfortunately I won't be able to read them all, but we have a range from dozens to none. Um, a few have said for, for learning foreign language. We have someone that's over a hundred, definitely part of their job. Uh, holiday specific games. All right, so we have a vast uh, array of answers there, and there's a bit of a question there about the serious games, and we'll definitely get into that as well. And I know that Ross will will define some some serious games and give us some parameters as well. All right, so again, thank you everyone for your quick answers. That gives us some some feedback about our audience, so we appreciate that and appreciate your sharing uh, your responses with us. So that is going to be a fantastic lead into Ross's part of the, the session, so he'll take over and, and really define what we're talking about, share his examples, his experiences, and just really give us a wealth of information. So what we'll do is we will invite Ross here to take over, and let's just quickly make him the presenter here so he can share his slides with you. And while we're doing that, welcome, Ross. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Jamaica. This is uh, it's wonderful. Let me uh, show my screen here. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's great to, uh, great to see we have uh, such a large set of gamers there. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I uh, will also say it's been, it's been really fun to uh, work with Raptivity. And you'll see as I go through some of these slides that they've sprinkled some of their game mechanics into the slides themselves. And uh, just to kind of demonstrate some of their examples as well as sort of how, how easy it is to sort of customize content and, and bring in um, both e-learning and uh, and sort of what we call productivity games into into a uh, a context that's fun and and uh, exciting. So appreciate uh, the opportunity to work with them as well. And uh, so, uh, oops. <laughs> um, so as we think about games, I, I first kind of we'll step back in history and just look uh, a little bit about the uh, sort of sort of evolution, I guess, is really, um, and you think back to the ancient Egyptians and uh, the Great Pyramid at Giza has, uh, they had um, uh, workers, who would leave it to whether that was intrinsic or ext extrinsic motivation for those workers, but, uh, but hauling the stones up to build the Great Pyramid, uh, the stones all had markings, and uh, there was the celebrants of Menkari, who was a pharaoh, and the friends of Menkari were the two sort of gangs that competed with one another to build the build the pyramid and then each day they were rewarded with uh, with food and drink at the end of the day for you know who could win quote unquote and um, so you know that games have just always been a part of, of life as, as we think back to ancient civilizations you know hunting and fishing today are more recreational activities but back then it was survival uh, festivals to celebrate the seasons children learning how to uh, play uh, learning how to be adults through the use of play and games, whether that's dolls or uh, colonial times, there was uh, a game of graces, hoop rolling, that uh, that taught young girls how to how to be graceful. Um, athletic competitions like the Olympics and things like that uh, were just part of part of everyday life. And you know, we think of the education, and then we move into the to the nineteenth century and the industrial era. Uh, Horace Mann in eighteen fifty two did a lot of work to. Uh, Provide to help the the states the state provide compulsory education for for children in Massachusetts and um, bringing sort of starting to bring structure and thinking then into the industrial revolution and the influence of of sort of this structure at work and really starting to separate out uh, um, games and play from whether it be work or education uh, to really start to separate the two and so uh, <clears throat> the idea of the uh, 
the time card and the punch clock or the organizational chart, even the idea of boss came to be in, in the Industrial Revolution. And, and also at the same time, you saw the greatest rise in sort of uh, dedicated recreational activities. So the, the National Park system, the traveling circus, all these things came, uh, came to be at the same time that we started to separate out work from, work from play. Uh, so thinking then going forward into sort of 20, 20th century, 21st century, um, early on the, the GI Bill and its influence on education, being able to provide uh, secondary education for, uh, for those returning from war. And then, you know, at, the, at around the same time, and this is 50s, 60s, uh, 1950s, 1960s, uh, the idea of the knowledge worker in his, uh, in his great book, The Landmark of Tomorrow, Peter Drucker coined the term going to term knowledge worker in 1957, and that was really the, the start of this rise of the creative class where people started to use their minds uh, to get work done rather than, the, than physical labor. And so when we think about now coming into the 21st century now, our, our, our world is changing uh, fairly dramatically. It's a, it's a global multicultural workforce. Uh, people are working longer. It's multi-generational. Uh, in education, the, the idea of MOOCs or massively open online courses, uh, new learning techniques, the idea of uh, sort of always connected and, and uh, mobility and the influence of all these things. And, and then in the workforce, how these, how these factors influence uh, and can help bring about organizational trust and productivity as we t try, and, uh, try and connect with people both in an educational or e-learning context as well as in day-to-day -day work. Um, it's a much more challenging thing that we don't have sort of the, the singular, you know, singular culture, singular demographic in terms of whether it's an employee or a learner. Uh, they've changed. There's lots more diversity. Um, so, you know, just recently the Martin Luther King's uh, 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, the I Have a Dream speech. And so for the next few slides, I'll just ask you to kind of imagine that we're back in 1963. And, um, and then I'm going to descend from the future through this miracle of audio technology and, uh, and this thing that's not invented yet called the internet um, to tell you about what the future is going to be like in terms of some demographics and statistics. And so uh, I, I'll come in and say first off that, that the world population is going to more than double in 50 years and, uh, and continue well beyond that, that you know, another, uh, another 50 years after that, it will more than triple for where we are today. And so just the, the idea of, of globalization and just the rise in just the human population is, is very significant and, and at rising at an accelerating pace. And so if we were to shrink this down to the, this global village down to 100 people, we would have uh, 61 would be Asian, 7 would be from Europe, but 70 of them would, would play games. And actually we saw uh, <laughs> almost like it was planned. That was... Uh, that was our poll question, and, and we saw that exact number. And so when we think about it, and I'm sure, you know, if we did something similar to, uh, to where everybody is tuning in from, um, I'm sure we have a very diverse and distributed set of attendees. And so to see that uh, games can have such an influence, uh, again, you know, coming forward maybe another 10 years from my time, I'm 50 years ahead of your time, uh, everyone under the age of 25 will have been raised with a digital world, um, a digital maven. Uh, the story I like to tell here is my uh, two-year-old nephew who is, uh, you know, he's, he's walking, you know, walking well, but he can pull out a, a, a phone, flip, flip it open, you know, swipe it open, unlock it, find his picture or game or take a picture of his brother. Um, you know, if, if you think back well, to your time, um, two-year-olds didn't have that same capabilities or that same exposure to technology. Uh, that we know that um, more young children know how to play games and swim or ride a bike, and you imagine this in, in uh, 1963 is a pretty significant um, change. Uh, and 70% of kids uh, under the age of five can use a computer mouse, but only 11% can tie their shoes. And I think uh, for those of you with, with small children, uh, also contributing to this statistic is the invention of Velcro shoes. Uh, but um, but just this prevalence of computer technology in, in 
the youth is, is a significant change. And that also, and this is maybe more relevant in the, in the 70, 1970s and 80s, but the, the fact that two-thirds of parents believe that games are a positive part of kids' lives. And the, the shift in demographic from the sort of teenage boy in the basement in the dark playing, game, playing a console game 24-7 um, has shifted to mobile games, games in education, e-learning, um, a much different sort of game demographic. Uh, and also the world of work is changing. That uh, <clears throat> Almost 50% of the people work beyond regular business hours and a third do personal work activities at work. And so, you know, the uh, e-commerce and, and Amazon and, and uh, digital banking and all these things allow you, you know, uh, where you used to maybe in 1963 run, the, run to the bank at, at lunchtime, you can now just open a website and balance your checkbook or make a payment. And so uh, this integration, and again, this is all enabled by knowledge work, right? That you, you, because it's creative work, uh, you can take a break and take time. And, and I'll touch on how we can use game mechanics to help there. But, but the U.S. has almost 70 million social gamers. This is a couple years old data, but, um, but just the, the prevalence or pervasiveness of games uh, is just, it's phenomenal. And text messages, uh, 9.6 trillion text messages last year. So this digital days and digital natives, uh, changes in communication and, and globalization really have a big, big impact on the way we work and, and how we uh, get our information. 76 billion mobile app downloads, uh, just this, this prevalence of mobility. Uh, and so this is a, uh, when we think about what 21st century learners want, uh, this is from Donald Tapscott's uh, Growing Up Digital, and you notice a little Raptivity animation there. Um, the, uh, but you think about what, what learners want, and then put this in the context of what games and play can provide. And, uh, and so thinking about how do we shift the way people can get information, the way people can learn. And uh, it's um, these, and so I guess you can fast forward now from 1963, and welcome back to, to uh, September 12th, oops, and um, so I'll walk through a couple examples that we've done here uh, in the Skype division at Microsoft, and um, we have been uh, experimenting with the use of, of games in the workplace, or call it, we've been calling it productivity games, enterprise gamification, uh, for almost 10 years now, and uh, had some had some great results and some spectacular failures, of which uh, you'll get the benefit of, of our education here and um, to hopefully be able to avoid some of the mistakes that we made and, and capture some of the success. Uh, but this was a recent one uh, that we used to, um, it's called Ishii, and uh, we, we wanted to, we were moving into a new physical space and we wanted to encourage people to explore the buildings as well as uh, meet new people. Uh, so we have different roles and responsibilities across the across the team and wanted to get people who wouldn't normally work together to meet one another. Um, and so uh, we had sensors, and I'm not sure if you can see there, uh, swiping the card key down at the bottom there, uh, but we had sensors and, and display stations around the building, and uh, we had teams of roughly six to eight people who uh, would get an invitation. They, they, they first signed up to play, and then they would get an invitation to go check in at one of these stations. And after they checked in, made a round of checking in at each of them, uh, they, then had to, they then got a sort of a dual invitation to find a partner and check in simultaneously at different stations. And so people had to meet, they had to coordinate, uh, and, and really it was a short two-week uh, two sprint to, uh, to play, but we actually, uh, one, of the, one of the teams got, a, got up to sort of a level where eight of them had to synchronize together to, to uh, to get, and I'll show a couple pictures of um, some of this, but it was really enabled people to reach out and engage and meet one another. And we had some simple survey questions and stuff to really try to connect people with similar interests. Um, and again, you can see one of the principles here is that these don't have to be dramatic. You can, you know, some good game design can be, you know, low cost, very low tech, and uh, and really still have uh, pretty significant results. So another example is we wanted to, we did some work with TEDx in Seattle to, uh, we wanted to kind of engage um, uh, attendees outside of, the, outside of the talks to get people connecting. And so we built a little video booth uh, where people could record 
inspirational videos about what they had just heard or listened to, and then we put this up. This is a big touchscreen device, and we had a couple different games. You could sort videos and spin them around, and so you can see these are a couple um, slam poets from Seattle who were actually speaking at the event, but they had a lot of fun with, with this. And, and, you know, there's a little more technology in this one, but from a game perspective, it's very simple, you know, so... Uh, then here's a uh, an example from Raptivity, and and just to show uh, how you know and, and how easily we can create content, and so we can kind of flip through here. And so if this you imagine this is an e-learning game, or uh, you want to do some specific training or principles or practices, and then you can kind of click and get a little more information. And um, the the idea of just you know changing the way you present information, it's it's you know it's it's very akin to uh, the uh, you know the shift in communication. The fact, if you think about the technology that we're using here to to all connect with one another and share information, and so alternative ways like this to really bring about uh, some different changes. Uh, here's some uh, some other simple games we built uh, to help test uh, Link, which is uh, an audio video communication tool for enterprise, similar to Skype for the enterprise, um, and. Uh, you know, here we were testing. We were adding ink support to uh, to the Windows 8 uh, client, and so we did a little charades kind of or, or Pictionary type game where people could draw street signs, and it's a great way to kind of bring people in and get them using the feature, which is really what we want from a testing perspective, but to have fun while doing it. We found that uh, there's a lot of value if you know if you can get the marketing manager from another division to spend time exercising your product because they're going to be more like the customer than than the engineer who's actually working on that feature so um, using games to kind of attract uh, effort there has, has been a great success for us in terms of how to uh, how to get broad participation so when we think about the broader thing what do what do games what can games bring uh, to sort of an e-learning environment to the, to the workplace and and so when we think about uh, what, what do we want in, in a healthy workplace, a healthy educational setting? Uh, the idea of sort of trust, experimentation, creativity, innovation, uh, risk-taking. And so games can provide some structure, right? And uh, Dutch philosopher Johan Hui Zenga uh, talked to his book, Homo Ludens, talks about the magic circle of play. And a, a good example is if you think about well, a famous example is, is a golf course, right? That you could very easily pick up the the ball and just walk over the hole and drop it in and you know hole in one uh, but that's not as fun as, as trying to, to hit it with a golf club and, and use different clubs to advance the ball into the hole and uh, and so yet similarly a two-year-old might enjoy it just picking it up and trying to drop it in the hole because it might be a coordination but the structure around the game is sort of what keeps it interesting and keeps it fun and and if you think about games in an educational setting the same sort of thing they can provide some structure where you can advance through material or through learning activities uh, and feel and, and feel the progress from the game mechanics as you advance. Uh, as we saw in our Ishii game, uh, games can facilitate interactions. And so whether it's teacher-student or student-student uh, interaction, game mechanics can bring those things together and, and create uh, relationships and interactions that might not otherwise happen. They transcend global culture, and this is a picture of folks on our team. But the, uh, you know, I can sit down with someone from, you know, another another country and play a game of chess, and we may not even speak the same language. So, so in terms of the, the cultural awareness of what games can bring, as we, again, as we think back to, to the some of the statistics on population growth and globalization, both in a, in a corporate or enterprise work environment as well as educational environment, we have a multicultural, multi-generational society today. And so using games to help bridge that and create connections uh, is, a, is a great technique. Games can help establish the, the social norm. And you think about the, you know, in the workplace or, or even in the educational setting, the, the sort of market-based rewards. The, uh, financial rewards or, or you know grades and those types of things um, is one way to reward but games can offer things that, that alternatives that can augment those traditional rewards and and help establish engagement and motivation in ways that the traditional rewards may fall short 
They support risk. Uh, I can. I am more way more comfortable taking a risk in a game than I might be in my job or in my in my class uh, because the the cost of failure is is much more significant in quote the real world. And when we think about a game, it's you know the risk might be well I lost the game. Um, for those of you that know that I lost the game. Um, uh, if you don't look up, I lost the game on Wikipedia. Uh, but the, um, <clears throat> but I, I will take risks in a, in a game that I might not ordinarily take. And we know that if we think about the behaviors around creativity and innovation, some of these same things that games can provide, uh, collaboration opportunities or interactions, uh, risk-taking, experimentation, freedom to fail, all a game structure can provide that context for all these great behaviors around creativity and innovation. and uh, and by removing some of the risk, making it voluntary, and adding play into it uh, really goes at that sort of Peter Drucker, knowledge worker type of uh, type of person and activity. And so another raptivity example here, uh, and this is again is just a, a very simple thing, but this is you know I'm I'm learning here, and we'll see how well I learned. I'm not sure I can. I know that's one of them. I think that's one. I think I'm probably going to get some of these wrong. I chose selfish the first time through, and I, uh, uh, I think there, and let's see, let's see how we go here. Oh, nope. <laughs> um, but you can see how that's, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's, uh, I did, I did better than last time, though. So it, it does work for learning, and, and it's an easy way to bring fun and play and just an alternative way to present information. Uh, and games can offer recognition, and so these are some of the, the winners from our uh, Ishii game, and and uh, and they are all from different disciplines, different teams, different roles. But you can see clearly happy to have worked together to uh, to be recognized as being able to simultaneously connect across some of our sensors. Uh, games offer reciprocity. I can do something for someone else and and collaborate and and help people out in the context of a game. And again, it removes some of the barriers that we normally see in the classroom or in the workplace uh, by providing a structure for people to, uh, to reciprocate, to thank one another, to collaborate with one another, and, and, uh, and take risks together. And that leads to, again, whether it's an educational learning setting or, or the workplace, leads to, to better uh, addressing the multicultural, global, uh, whether it's student base or, uh, or workplace population. So if there's one, uh, one slide here that kind of captures a lot of our learning, um, this is the one. And I'll kind of walk through a little bit, but this is, we've paid a lot of tuition in, in spectacular failures to learn uh, to put this slide together. But if you look at the, the three columns here, you have, this is sort of games in the workplace. Uh, it, it does extend to the classroom, although most of our experience has been in the workplace. Um, but you think about the skills, it's the core skills that I have, you know, I am able to, in our case, program in a certain language, or I know how to run the copy machine, or I can speak a language. Uh, and then unique skills, these are skills that I'm paid to be here for, things that, you know, I bring specifically to my job. And then expanding work skills are things that I can learn to do my job better. And this is where the e-learning uh, e learning games work really well. And then the two rows are the in-roll behaviors, uh, which are things that I do every day as part of my job, and then the organizational citizenship behaviors, which are uh, things that I can do to uh, make the organization a better place, but are not necessarily part of my job. So I can help my neighbor with a, with a problem, or I can clean the coffee pot at the end of the day. And what we've seen is core skills in the citizenship behavior areas. Uh, also, games work also very well in, in, those, in that sort of intersection. Uh, and then games that I can learn to do my own job, my day job better, uh, games work for, to expand those skills. So this is kind of the, and I'll, actually I'll talk about the middle column because this is where I think a lot of, a lot of early gamification uh, applications start out and maybe have less success, certainly an area where we, we learned uh, did not work well. And this is, uh, the way I describe this is the do Ross's job game. Uh, if I, if my boss comes out, okay, we're going to run the do Ross's job game this week, and 50 people sign up to play to do my job, and I come in tenth, it's kind of an awkward conversation because these are my unique skills that I'm being paid for and the things I'm supposed to do every day, and uh, I came in tenth at my own job, and so I uh, <clears throat> I am confused. You know, in a game here, I'm confused. Okay, if I come in first, does that mean I get to keep my job, or does that mean I get a, a promotion or a raise? Uh, the 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 thing we've 
sort of run into is that we have traditional rewards and, and sort of game mechanics in place already, right? I show up to get a paycheck. That's a reward, right? I might be after a promotion or, or, or a, uh, a raise. That's a reward. And then so when something comes along and puts points on top of that, I don't know the relationship between those points and the traditional rewards that I get. And so that confusion, you know, I, I often get kind of emotional and feel deceived, like, okay, you're just using this game to trick me to do more work. Uh, and so because I'm confused at which reward to, to go after. And so, uh, so games tend not to work. So we've kind of tried to keep our games in these two, these two corners where, uh, where they work a lot better and there's a lot less emotion and people are more than happy to play. The other thing with unique skills is you really don't have as many of them in an organization because by nature they're unique. And so uh, you, don't, you don't need to develop a game to, to attract those skills, just use some of the traditional me methods. So if we think about what gamers have um, and what people want either in, in an e-learning environment or in the workplace, uh, people want what gamers already have. They want it to be fair. They want feedback to be uh, easy, rapid. You know, if, if I'm fighting the dragon, I can reach down and pick up a sword and the dragon, you know, breathes fire on me and burns me up. I know the next time, hey, I better pick up the pail of water, right? Whereas in the workplace, I may try out a new technique or take a risk. I might not find out until an annual performance evaluation a year later that, oh, that was the right thing or the wrong thing to do. So that immediate feedback that gamers have, uh, open communication, games can keep people engaged and motivated and productive. Games can provide education that a lot of times you, you can't necessarily get in, in a consistent and engaging way in, in sort of the real world. So getting started here, this is sort of some of the things we've learned and another interesting uh, Raptivity example here we'll see. Um, but we think about, okay, so let, uh, boil it down, what, it, what have we learned? Um, specifically, uh, there'll be skeptics. Um, you know, some people think games are gimmicky. Uh, we don't work here, or we don't, we don't play here, we work. Um, and so not everyone plays games. How do I... How do I motivate people to play? And I think these are lined up. I'm going to click over the, the how card here, I think. Um, so how do you, how do you uh, address the skeptics is collect a lot of data, right? Just you want to instrument everything and really be able to show strong A, B comparisons. Here's with a game and here's without a game. Um, and then not everyone plays. How do, how do we motivate people? And, and you can target what we've done is target uh, there's player versus player is sort of the glory and shame of the leaderboard. Uh, there's player versus self, which is can I beat my own high score or my personal best? And then environment, things like puzzles and scavenger hunts, those type of things. And you might not get everyone to play, but if you go after those different types, uh, you'll get more players. And, and again, just to reemphasize, uh, there will be more skeptics. And, and so again, as much as you can provide to say, hey, here's what we've done with with a game and here what, what it was without uh, will really help to thwart the skeptics. Uh, how can I prove my success? How do I know it works? Um, really start with a clear objective. Uh, you really want to be specific about the behavior you want to change. I want to teach our e-learner X, Y, and Z. And I know how to measure that they learned X, Y, and Z, and, and that's all. Right? It's very easy to say, okay, we're going to do this great game and do all this wonderful stuff, but without sort of a clear objective, you, you'll fall short of your goal. Um, and then how do I find cheaters or broken rules or unfair challenges? And the, uh, the interesting piece is not everyone, because you're kind of, kind of appealing to discretionary time, right? That's what voluntary is. It's a citizenship behavior. It's a learning game. You, you're really not, uh, <clears throat> you're not um, overlaying it on the work or the, or the learning itself. Uh, you want to have a what we call a game master. There's a there's a, a physical you know person you can go to if you're a player and you feel like, uh, hey, this is unfair, or the player next to me did this in five minutes and it took me two days, uh, and they got more points or vice versa. Uh, someone who's approachable, who people can go to and ask questions or point out inconsistencies, is a, is a good success story. And then how do how do you fix if you find something? Oh, this we missed this or we didn't realize this. Uh, what we've done is we keep the duration very short, two weeks to a month maximum, um, because it's very hard. If you find something that's broken, it's very hard to stop the game in the middle and change the rules, because people feel, you know, hey, I just I was winning, and now you went and changed the rules on me. Um, so by keeping the game short, you can bring the game to an end, 
and then make adjustments and then roll out a new game later on. So uh, a, a much better way and feels more fair to the, to the players. So a little more on measurement, because this is, I think, a, a really important piece on applying games in e-learning and, and in the workplace. Because uh, again, you want to be very clear about what is your goal, what type of behavior do you want your players to uh, either create for you or start to exhibit or learn, um, but be very specific and clear, and that know that from the gameplay, you will be collecting data that will either support this or refute it and be able to tell whether that game has worked. Uh, I don't think it's possible to collect too much data. Uh, I think you, you really, it allows you to tune your game. You see uh, one of the examples I'll talk about in a little bit um, was for language quality. And one of the things we did was we found that people were, uh, were dropping off after a certain, a certain spot. And so we added leveling. You know, so right at that spot, they were, they were informed that, hey, there's a new level coming up. And, uh, and without knowing that people were dropping off at a certain spot, we wouldn't have known to add levels, which made the game much more successful. Uh, again, uh, on, can't, not possible to uh, overemphasize the role of skeptics. Uh, and if you can't get objective data about exactly what you're trying to do, uh, you know, that's obviously the best. Uh, subjective data is still better than none. So you really want to get something to show, hey, this worked or didn't work, or here's where I have to tune. Um, and we know that, that game mechanics motivate. Uh, you know, Farmville crop updates keep people riveted to their cell phones. Uh, and so it's up to, to, to the people deploying the game to know how much is too much, you know, because there is a risk that people, you know, in our, in our case, just stop doing their job and play the game all day long, right, which is great for the, the effort for the game, but a little too disruptive maybe for the for the day-to-day -day work. So so really understanding, you know, how to uh, how to guide the players on what's appropriate. We found the use of prizes with good game design, you really don't need prizes and that takes away from some of the challenges of being too disruptive. So a couple other quick game examples I'll, I'll walk through here um, and then we'll leave some time for some questions at the end. Uh, so this was the language quality game that I mentioned. Uh, this was for Windows 7, and uh, we rolled this out for a month towards uh, prior to release, internal to Microsoft employees, and had just tremendous success. So you can see this is essentially the entire game right here. Uh, basically, a dialogue would fly in, and a native language speaker would look at it, and they could you'll see maybe see in the upper right corner there. There's different pen colors and an eraser. They would highlight areas that they think the translation was incorrect or confusing, and then they would drag it either to a something wrong bucket there on the upper right or a looks good on the upper left, and then they get another dialogue. And then uh, after a certain number of screens, they see, oh, you're three screens away from level two. And you can see in the bottom right there's a, a simple leaderboard. We had leaderboards by individual and by language. and uh, and. That was about it. It was just a browser-based game that uh, we had just tremendous results. Uh, over 4,500 players played for uh, to review over 500,000 screens and uh, significant engagement from across the company for the quality of the linguistic quality of Windows 7. Uh, the team morale and engagement with subsidiaries uh, just just a, a spectacular result in terms of sort of getting real work done with by engaging the crowd with some simple game mechanics. Another one we did uh, was a thing called Communicate Hope, which was for Office Communicator, and this was to, uh, to raise money for disaster relief. And so uh, we would have players sign up to represent a charity, and they would uh, perform activities and give us feedback and earn points for their charity. And at the end, we gave away money apportioned by the points that each charity had, uh, had received. And what we saw, and this was a great example of A-B comparison. We had done a very similar program without a game the year before. Uh, and we saw 16 times the uh, amount of feedback with the game than without. And uh, another interesting thing we saw is that uh, um, two-thirds of the, player, the people who had signed up to play uh, gave us feedback versus three percent of those who did not, and again, very similar uh, similar uh, behavior or impact on the product. And then another one here. Uh, this is um, there's a process called threat modeling, where where engineers get around and think about malicious attacks and uh, how security vulnerabilities might 
be uh, <clears throat> be found in in different software features. And so this is a game based on a card game of hearts uh, that called Elevation of Privilege, where uh, people would sit around and play different types of threats, and then out of this could come your threat model. So uh, that's a great um, great sort of example from the security team, when the security team on on using games to sort of get get real work done and, and learn about how to uh, how to develop a threat model. So that's uh, that's what I have for now, and um, you know certainly we'll, I'll hand it back to Jamaica here. But uh, we try and share everything. Um, so there's this 42projects.org. Uh, all of what you see see here, as well as the paper and a lot of the data and some of the other articles and uh, videos and stuff that we've done are all uh, up here. And uh, you know my email's there. I welcome any questions if if you have down the road, or, or if I can share any more information. But uh, I think with that, let me just double check here. Um, yes, with that, I will hand it back to Jamaica, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Great. Thank you so much, Ross. That was fantastic information and getting some, uh, some good comments and good feedback. So what we'll do now is let me come back here and share my screen with everyone. We'll just wrap up a little bit here and kind of uh, tie it back a little to Raptivity, kind of summarize a bit of what Ross talked about, and then we will take as many uh, questions as we can. So if I were to, to summarize here some key takeaways that Ross was saying, and I also invite um, the audience to everyone that, that was listening so attentively, if there's some, some key takeaways or some ways that you might implement some of what you heard or saw today. We're really interested to hear that as well, how um, the session kind of influenced you. But I would say some things are the importance of immediate feedback. I'm talking about games and someone wants to be recognized for what they're doing or finding out if they're on the, the right or wrong track, if they're giving the right answers, if they, you know, maybe it's an e-learning course and they went through some material and now they're going to play a game. Um, which actually might be like a final quiz or something, but it's in the form of a game, getting that immediate feedback is going to let them know if they got the information or not. It's also going to uh, help motivate them to keep going. And then I was really fascinated when Ross was talking about the, the survivor games and that you take more risks in a game. And I think that that could be applied also... Um, we're looking at their activity software, some of the gaming templates. If you're in a different environment or a stimulation or a gaming environment, maybe you'll make a choice you wouldn't make necessarily in real life because you're not sure of the outcome. But in that gaming environment, you definitely are more willing to try something different, to go down a different path. And then the rewards and recognition, uh, like Ross was bringing up, it is important to be recognized. Maybe it's important you're trying to beat your own personal best score. Uh, maybe as a group you come together and everyone plays a game and uh, the most people from your group play versus another group. Or maybe it's you're trying to best your score, or get the most points, whatever that is. So really games can help foster that in, in a work environment. Um, and also the games can help set the clear objective. So if you are starting off in a game, maybe the objective is to get the most points. It's to finish first. It's to, um, you know, get to level four. So you can definitely have clear objectives, and then it helps to motivate. So you know you're getting close to the next level. You know you just about solved the puzzle. You only had one question left when the timer went out. So if it's um, set up that you have your clear objectives at the beginning, you have clear instructions, your learner is going to be motivated and really pumped up to keep going through. And then the last point there, just that you can use these games in different team collaborations um, for different situations. Ross gave the example of when they physically move buildings and they wanted to um, get people to get familiar with each other and also the building, and then it also can, can foster healthy competition. Um, and Raptivity games can definitely help you do that as well. And maybe what we'll do here is just take a look at a couple. Hopefully you had a chance to do or to play some of these games at the beginning of the webinar. But if not, let's just share a couple with you. These were the five that we had made 
available, and we have many, many more templates in Raptivity than, than these, but just to share a couple of them. So here we have a million dollar quiz, and again, this is all customizable. So the template set up that you're going to have a question, there's going to be options, some kind of a, a value system. Here it's dollar amounts, but it certainly doesn't have to be. It could be whatever value system or reward system is, is appropriate. And the learner's presented with the question. They're going to answer it. If they're sure, they're going to continue. And immediate feedback is given. And they can continue in climbing up the point system. So here, of course, our goal is to reach that top tier without um, incorrectly answering a question. So another example here is what we call a rapid check game. And this is, um, again, super customizable. So it's going to be any topic. But the point of this game is there's going to be a question and some images are going to appear. And it's the learner's job to answer the questions as quickly as they can as it's, as it's going by. And the quicker I click, the, the questions will keep appearing. And what will happen with this game is if I'm getting it incorrectly, the image might come back across. I might get another chance to answer it. But once the time is up or I've, I've answered them all, you're immediately going to see feedback. And it will summarize my answers with what the correct answers are. So again, in a visual way, you can see I had six correct. I had six incorrect. And then it shows the correct answers, what I should have mapped. So it's possible to, to get those four correct there in just four tries. So again, giving immediate feedback and summarizing. And then one other that we'll look at here is a game everyone's probably pretty familiar with, a Wheel of Fortune type of game. So this one has an element of randomization to it. You're not sure what the topic is going to be. So that also adds an interesting gaming element to it. And we have our different answers, our different options. And again, as soon as you submit, you're going to get immediate feedback, whether it's correct or incorrect. And if it's the incorrect answer given, the correct answer and the reason why can also be there. So regardless of the answer provided, the learner will know if it was right or wrong. And you can see there also from a reward system, it's showing me how many I have correctly answered. So again, these are just a couple of examples of games in Raptivity. We have over 40 really solid gaming templates that are customizable. And we have many other templates that can be used in a gaming environment as well. But um, 40 of them that are uh, really built around games. And again, this is the link that we shared. And we'll make sure that everyone has a link to the Raptivity gaming samples as well so that you can, can try them out and play if you didn't already have an opportunity to. So that being said, we'll just wrap up with a few other brief announcements here and then turn it to the audience for your, your questions and the feedback you gave us. Just a few things from the Raptivity side. We had a new interaction come out actually just today. And again, some of you may have played it earlier. And this is being timed, so it's going to add that, that element of, of wanting to play quickly and get the correct answers. Our learners presented with a question. And what they need to do is they need to pick out the answer in this word bank. And this image here could actually be anything. It might be um, an image and you're asking the learner to find part of a picture. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a word. And again, you can see that immediate feedback is given, whether it's right or wrong. So again, this is our latest template. And we'll, again, definitely share some information with you about that as well. It's from our Evolve Pack. Just a couple other pieces of Raptivity information. Uh, recently, we have started supporting ActionScript 3. That was uh, something that our clients had been uh, saying would be helpful, so we've managed to, to do that. So we're quite excited, and that's being very well received. So that's the latest on the technology front. And then if you are interested in wanting to, to maybe add some games and, and maybe look for a software to help you do that, we do have some 
special offers on our software. We also have annual licensing options that are available. And depending on, on the way that's set up, it could be um, even less than $100 a month for access to the entire Reptivity library on that annual licensing option. So lots of, lots of different ways to, to start using Reptivity to try it out. And if you want to get in touch with us, we have a couple different LinkedIn groups, um, a Reptivity one. And then we have an e-learning, which is everything e-learning. Fantastic group of people are there. Lots of great conversations happening. And of course, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. And if you have any questions, you want to try out Raptivity, you want to get in touch with us, and we're not able to answer your question during the session, you can find us at raptivity.com, or you can, of course, write to us at info at raptivity.com. So, We'll go ahead and do is take a look here at some of the questions and feedback that that you are giving us there. And I think, um, Ross, maybe while I'm sorting through these, a question that, that came up a few times is, if you were to give, I don't want to say simple, but how would you define a game or a serious game? If you were to put some parameters on it, you know, in just a, a brief description, how would you define that? Yes, thank you. I tried to go through and answer uh, a few of the questions in in, in the question section, um, but and that, that was one of them. But the uh, but I think kind of serious games are kind of any sort of game element, game mechanic that's used for quote unquote serious activity. And serious activity is, is somewhat nebulous, but but things like raising awareness. So uh, there's several games on uh, on you know whether it's uh, poverty or hunger um, to raise awareness as part of gameplay uh, games for health uh, you know the Fitbit and a lot of the like the the Xbox connect and, and we fit uh, type of games uh, we have a very small slice in kind of what we call productivity games um, uh, but really any sort of game element game mechanic you know whether it's an entire game or just something some small piece that's used for a serious activity um, and sort of as opposed to a fun or ed entertainment activity, and so so games for learning would be a, would fall into a serious game genre rather than entertainment. Oh, fantastic! Thank you. Um, excellent. Okay, so a couple others here. I see. We'll take a Raptivity one, then give one back to Ross. Question about um, the customization: if the information you input in Raptivity can be in a different language, and absolutely. Um, we have Raptivity users all around the world in over 60 countries in, in all kinds of languages. So you can definitely, you're not limited to just English as the, the language that you use there, the Unicode compliant. So another question here for you, Ross, and the question here is, uh, senior lead, excuse me, senior leaders who often need to learn, they haven't responded to any type of gaming feel. Is there any ideas for helping them to, to get on the gaming bandwagon? <laughs> yes, uh, that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, we have some experience there. Uh, you know, if you can roll a small pilot um, and collect data, uh, and certainly on that website, we have some data you're welcome to, uh, you know, for the, the Windows Language Quality Game in particular. Um, uh, the, really, the, the, you, you want to get, and again, uh, sort of another question I answered in there, that the, the makeup, what we found, the makeup of the world workplace is there are, you know, that 70% number is, is at least a, a minimum for accurate in terms of what sort of employee population plays games. And so there are a lot of gamers that can help you crowdsource game design, right? There are a lot of people who want to be game developers, uh, you know, and certainly that doesn't necessarily require software. You can, you, or software development skills. But um, the idea of, hey, I'm going to take these five people, hey, would you guys like to play a game and, and help me practice something? Do that on, on the side and then as part of your pitch and part of your presentation, say, okay, I ran this e-learning activity, and here were five people who did it, and here's five people who did it with the use of a game, and here was the results. And you know, 
presumably and most likely you will find that the games can keep people engaged, they can motivate, they can feed all those things we talked about. Um, the game results will be more successful than the non-game, and, and it's really about data. And there's a lot of uh, um, data. If you, if you just go search uh, for gamification, enterprise gamification, there are a lot of people sharing data and results. And it's uh, it's you know IBM's doing some work. There's a couple a couple uh, companies, Badgeville and Bunchball, who are um, <clears throat> doing some doing some similar uh, studies and. Um, so you can find some material out there, and uh, and certainly you know get in touch with me if I can help in any way. But the uh, but it is a it is a rising trend, and there are more and more companies who are doing it that can help seed uh, seed your efforts and and uh, supplement data that you collect within your own organization. No, that's great, and I think you probably kind of touched on this as well, but kind of a question that dovetails off that. Maybe once you get that leadership go ahead, or they're you know, willing to try it. Do you think there's a good way to introduce it then into the workplace? Do you think you need to kind of explain to people that even though you're playing a game, hey, it's okay, and you are learning? You know, how do you kind of address yeah. that that mindset shift? Yeah, it's um, you know, it's you know, it's it's a great great question. I'm not sure. We're kind of experimenting with that because the idea of calling it a game automatically makes it appealing to players, right? Uh, but changes, you know, and I think I saw a question in there, is, is it something in disguise? And, and, you know, as long as you're staying out in those discretionary, in those corners, whether it's the uh, learning, games for learning, or uh, uh, citizenship behaviors for core skills, uh, you know, people realize it's an additive activity. It probably, depending on the culture of your organization, it may help to, to frame it as like, hey, we're, and I, I, I like to use, you know, experimentation, we're trying this out, uh, we're going to see how this works, and so we're, you know, you know, let's say, I'll take standards of business compliance, a, a fascinating topic for those who like to learn, and, and so building a game, say, hey, we're going to try a game to learn standards of business compliance. Uh, this time, and so if you're interested, go here and try it out. And so it's really a hey, we're we're trying this, and it's an experiment. Uh, it's outside of your core uh, requirements or your core job, uh, core, and you know the the skills that you're being paid, your enrolled behavior. Uh, this is not that. This is something. Hey, it's an experiment. It's outside the lines here. If you want to try it out, because we know that this magic circle of play. One of the things that makes it fun is it's voluntary. Right, you you choose to follow the rules of golf, right? In in most cases, right, unless you're a professional or something. But, um, but you choose, you know. And and so, what makes it engaging and motivating to continue to play is the structure, and and that has to be entered voluntarily. And so, if it's not voluntary, then it's work. And so, I think uh, really introducing it as that. And if you can get senior leaders to make that introduction, that helps, right? When we had the language quality game and we had some senior leaders send broad mail, uh, that got more people to play than, you know, than me sending mail. No, oh, fantastic. Thank you. I'm sure that was very helpful. And we're getting some some great feedback that your perspectives are, are giving people some some good ideas and some, so I think, I'm sure they'll be implementing them here, taking it up to their, their management. And lots of appreciation for sharing your uh, successes and well as failures. That was really fantastic. Excellent. I'd love to learn from you as, as you all deploy things or learn things. That, you know, I'd love to hear from you and hear about them because I think it's, it's a growing area and, and we're still experimenting and learning ourselves. Yeah, and let's see, maybe... I'm not sure if we did, but maybe we can put out your contact information again. For some reason, it didn't get on this slide here. We can, so yeah, so we're getting a few questions. So we'll definitely um, make Ross's information available to everyone as well. And I know that we are kind of across the top of our hour here, so we'll see if we can hit some more questions here if there's, there's some more. But just want to take the opportunity to Thank everyone for their participation. We know that it's our audience's uh, response to the polls and their comments and their feedback that are really vital to the, the success and the, you know, the value out of the webinar. So we really want to thank everyone for being 
open with their uh, poll answers and your questions. Um, and of course, a huge thank you to Ross for sharing your time and expertise. You have so much to share and you compacted so much in a few minutes, so that was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you all for, for your time and thank you for having me, Jamaica. And this is, yeah. it's, hope it was helpful and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, no, f judging from the, the comments here, everyone really appreciated your, your insight and um, your experiences. It was, uh, I would say, just the, the open honestness of it, the successes, the failures, what worked, what didn't, and this is the way it's going, and here's maybe how to make it successful for your organization. So, you know, that's the, what I'm seeing there. And we also want to, uh, yeah, thank you to our technical team who did the, made the webinar happen. Everyone that was working on the, the back side of things, that was helpful as well. So we'll go ahead here and if, um, and see if there's any more questions we can take, but just wanted to, to thank everyone to take the opportunity to do that. So let's see here. And I know, Ross, you said you were answering some during, so that's fantastic. Yeah. Let's see if there's anything else. Let's see. People were appreciating the games, appreciating um, your experiences. Uh, yes, to those who are wondering about the recording, it, it uh, was recorded, and we'll definitely make that link available. So, fantastic. All right, so again, we'll keep the, the question box open here if you have any other thoughts, comments, questions, and we'll do our best to address them. But otherwise, uh, we just want to thank everyone again for your participation, and we're excited to see you for our next session. All right, and for those of you that are still online, if we didn't get to your question, we will do our our best to get you a response. So if we don't uh, verbally respond, look out for a <laughs> an email, or we'll definitely send the, a question and answer document with the link to the recording and so on. Um, oh, and there's a few questions about that matrix um, that you showed, Ross, with the yes. Um, if there's, if you have some more examples for the cells um, to understand where it works and doesn't work, maybe just uh, some, if you have any other yes, yes, probably um, the uh, probably the best. Uh, we have a paper on that actually on that 42projects.org site that that kind of goes into detail of exactly what each box is, but kind of briefly the sort of, um, if people can remember, uh, the rows are enroll behaviors and citizenship behaviors, and the columns are core, unique, and expanding skills. And so really focusing on where they work um, are the games for learning and the, and the games to, you know, the clean the coffee pot after work. Uh, where they don't work in, in the middle, the unique skills, it's either I'm confused because it's a do Ross's job game and I already get paid, uh, or my skills are so unique that you can just come and ask me for a citizenship behavior. If I'm the only one who knows how to clean the coffee pot at the end of the day, you don't need to build a game to do that. Just come and ask me to do it. You, do, you won't have many players because they're unique skills. And then the core skills for in-roll behavior tends to clutter up the day job. So if, if a core skill is I know how to speak a language or I know how to type an email. Um, adding games to measure my my productivity for an enrolled behavior there, I, it, I, again, I kind of feel deceived. Well, I just do this anyways. Why am I earning points for each email I send or each phone call I answer? Um, and um, the, let's see, the bottom, the uh, bottom right, which would be the expanding skills for citizenship behaviors, uh, since it's a it's a citizenship behavior. It's, it's kind of a voluntary activity. So if I think about helping my neighbor, playing a game to get better at helping my neighbor seems to get in the way of just helping my neighbor. You know, you can, again, it's, it might work there, but it's, again, kind of unnecessary. Um, whereas the core skills, you know you're going to have a lot of players expanding skills. Nobody knows how to do that. So you could just, you know, if it's how to, if it's a, if it's, 
uh, a course or an expanding skill to uh, <clears throat> to learn you know how to better communicate with people or something like that and then I can apply that to helping my neighbor then that can help the organization be better but it's really not a citizenship behavior so again there's a paper up there that that talks in more detail and certainly if you have questions that you know, drop me some email, I'll be happy to take them off offline. Or I see some of you have found me on Twitter and LinkedIn, so that always works too. Fantastic. Thank you. And hopefully everyone was seeing that there. I tried to pull it back up on the screen while you were talking. Um, and just one, well, a couple more questions here. If you were to distinguish um, between, I guess the question is, do you? Do you distinguish between gamification and serious games? Are those two <laughs> things, or do they cross? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's an interesting. That's that, the answer there. I think is longer than than we have here, <laughs> but uh, but, um, but so I think gamification is the use of game elements in non-game situations. Some of those non-game situations can be serious, and so there's some intersection and overlap. Gamification is a newer term than serious games is. Uh, so. You know, gamifying a serious activity could fall in the context of, or the Venn diagram, the overlapping circles of those two terms. But there's a lot of energy around the term gamification um, from different people. I'm sort of some very much in favor, some very much not. Um, and so I think it describes a similar activity. Uh, and I think maybe that's the best way to say it. the use of game mechanics in non-game situations that are serious would be that intersection. I think that's a, a fair enough summation. Like you said, you could talk for another hour on it. So that was, I think, helpful. So hopefully that provided some insight there. All right. So I think that I think we've touched on most everything. And again, like I mentioned, if we missed something or you had a, a very specific question, we'll certainly um, get in touch with you about that. So again, perfect. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone and and of course Ross again for your expertise and for again sharing your experiences. I think we learn sometimes the best from other people's success and failures and gives us a kind of a launching point and some fresh ideas. So excellent. Really well, I appreciate that. Yes. Well, thanks again. I appreciate everyone's time and especially those who hung out in the after party here and uh, <laughs> and just uh, appreciate the opportunity and look forward to hearing more. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks Great. to everyone else who I think Ross, hung out for the after party. You got some, <laughs> some good questions answered. So thanks for sticking with us. And we will uh, wish you the best for the rest of your day. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>